Hi, Rock Church Squamish. This is Jeff Bucknam. Uh, it is really great to have you guys with us. We're going to be together for the next several weeks as Glenn and Janice are away. Uh, we wanted to give you a special welcome. I remember you very fondly. In fact, I uh, preached there several times. We drove down from Whistler on one occasion, and my daughter felt a little bit ill at the beginning of the service. And when I started preaching at the Eagle Eye Theater, she came down to the front, ran in front of me, and threw up at the doorway. So that's what comes to our mind when we think of Squamish. Actually, it is, it is uh, a delight to have you with us. Uh, one of my favorite places, one of my favorite churches in British Columbia is the Rock Church Squamish. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to Mark Birch. Well, it's great to be together again this weekend, wherever you're watching this service from. We're starting a new series in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, and it is going to be a great journey over the next seven weeks as we dig into this book of Scripture. Before we dive in, I want to take just a moment to give you a quick update on some of the things that are happening in the, the whole realm of multiplication. Uh, as you know, if you've been listening, uh, a major focus for Northview is our leadership development and our partnership in planting and replanting new churches. And so we, from time to time, give you a little bit of an update. There's four things I want to mention just briefly. Uh, the new church up in Kelowna, Praxis Church. We're so excited that Josh and Rebecca Duell have landed. They're on the ground. They're getting their legs under them. And they're beginning to meet with people. So if you know people in Kelowna who need to be part of a new Bible teaching church, uh, just Google Praxis Church Kelowna and you'll find their website you can get the information that you need. Secondly, you may have heard us talk in the last year about Real Life Community Church over in Fleetwood, neighborhood in Surrey. Uh, they lost their pastor last year. Unfortunately, Mike Roth passed away from cancer. And they have been joining us for the last year uh, in this online forum. And just a month ago, their membership voted to formally ask Northview to adopt them as a campus of Northview Church and to work with them to replant that church over the next three to five years as an independent church in the Fleetwood neighborhood in Surrey. And we're really excited to pray into that and ask you to pray with us as we look for a campus pastor for that church. Finally, there's another group that is joining us just for this series. Uh, some of you will have heard us talk about the Rock Church up in Squamish over the years. A sister church in our denomination, uh, planted by Glenn Davies and his wife Janice alongside of him. And they have served faithfully in Squamish for over a decade in ministry. And they are taking in the month of February and March a much deserved sabbatical break for ministry, and so the Rock Congregation is going to join us for these next seven weeks leading up to Easter as we look into this book of Ecclesiastes. So I just want to say a warm welcome to those of you up in Squamish uh, who are joining us for these next few weeks. Great to have you with us. Finally, I also want to update you on a special offering that we put in front of you back in the fall. I don't think we've had the chance to give you the total numbers on where we came in in that project. But back in the fall, we told you about a renovation project for a new church called Midtown Church in Vancouver. The old Culloden Mennonite Brethren Church voted in the summer to close their doors and to give their building over to a new group that would replant it, a church that's now going to be called Midtown Church. And we came to you in the fall saying, you know what, we'd like to help them renovate that building. And we would love to raise $150,000 to help them towards their project. By the end of the year, the end of December, when we closed off that offering, I'm so excited to tell you we raised just over $300,000, 302 plus some change. You can imagine there were some large gifts, there were some small gifts. What's exciting is over 200 individuals took part in that project. What was really cool, I have to show you these. We got a couple letters. One came to Tri-City Church. One came here to Northview in the mail. Two letters from children and they basically say, Dear Midtown, I hope you can fix your church and I want to help. There was like $15 in loose change in those notes from children. What a really cool, uh, just, yeah, a cool experience. So we wanted to update you on those things uh, before we jump into the message today. So, as I said, we're starting a new series. And today's message, I titled it, Making Sense of the Dash. Making Sense of the Dash. And maybe you have heard Linda Ellis's poem, but it goes like this. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. 
He referred to the dates on the tombstone from beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But what he said mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. Not only those who loved them know what that little line is worth, no, or rather only those who know them know what that little line is worth. And there's a few more stanzas, but then it concludes this way. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? There is a growing number of books in recent years. It's a small number, but a steady stream of secular books that have called into question the craziness of the times that we're living in, specifically the radical reshaping of our worldview here in the West in the name of political correctness, so-called progressive thinking, historical revisionism. Uh, you walk through the sections in the bookstore and you're familiar, the fiction, the nonfiction, the history section, business, leadership, the arts. There's a section on cooking and a, a section on sports. And I think every bookstore should have a section called the don't be stupid section. Uh, I brought some of my favorites along, books that I would categorize as the don't be stupid type books. Uh, the Coddling of the American Mind, The Madness of Crowds, 12 Rules for Life, The Road to Character. Books like these take a step back from the craziness of normal life, quote unquote, and they ask sobering questions. Does this worldview that's being forced on us all around actually make sense? Does it work for us? Does it ultimately bring satisfaction and joy that I want? Now, I find books like this provocative for a couple of reasons. First, because they have the audacity to stand up against the onslaught, really the avalanche of postmodern angst, and against the insanity of political correctness run amok. As you read through them, you find yourself saying things like, I can't believe the author can get away with saying things like this. Wow, this takes a lot of courage. He must have a lot of enemies. And yet they seem to make common sense. Secondly, I find them provocative because they are not written from an intrinsically biblical point of view. None of these authors are preachers or theologians or religious scholars. They certainly would not call themselves evangelicals. And yet what they write lines up so well with the Bible's perspective on life, meaning, purpose, and human flourishing. Things that make you go, hmm. The challenge that they give us is that we would live examined lives. Uh, this one here, The Road to Character by David Brooks, starts this way. Recently, I've been thinking about the difference between the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the ones that you list on your resume, the skills that you bring to the job market and contribute to external success. The eulogy virtues are deeper. They're the virtues that get talked about at your funeral, the ones that exist at the core of your being, whether you're kind and brave, honest or faithful what kind of relationships you formed. Now, most of us would say that the eulogy virtues are more important than the resume virtues. Now, what Brooks goes on to argue is this, that our culture seems to be built around cultivating the resume virtues. While most of us need help is in the eulogy virtues. Now, you might be wondering, and if you've heard me preach before, you know that I like to read. You might be wondering, what on earth does any of this have to do with a weekend church service and our study of Scripture? But I hope to convince you that conversations like these and books like these actually have everything to do with the study that we are about to venture into. You see, we're starting this new book, the book of Ecclesiastes. And over the next seven weeks, we are going to dig into the philosophical worldview, the profound questions about life that this book of literature puts in front of us. It's a book in which we meet a teacher. 
A teacher who has set out to understand all the philosophies of life that make the world go round. And not just to understand them, but literally to experience them, to plunge headlong into their implications, their practices of these worldviews, and asking questions all along. Can I truly find meaning in these pursuits? The teacher that he is, we are introduced to is looking for meaning, for purpose, for satisfaction. And Ecclesiastes challenges us in at least three different ways. It challenges us to think differently, to see differently, and ultimately it will free us to live differently. So to think differently, to see differently, and hopefully to live differently. To use David Brooks' language, to focus on the eulogy virtues, or to go back to that poem that we would really think about making sense of our dash. Now, you'll want to have your Bibles open. We're going to deal with the first 11 verses today. Ecclesiastes is just a short little book in the Old Testament, just eight or ten pages in most Bibles. Uh, if you find Psalms and Proverbs near the middle of your Bibles, you'll find Ecclesiastes just next door. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Uh, it is part of the wisdom literature. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, I'll just tell you this, that the Old Testament has 39 books that were written before Jesus Christ lived. 17 of them were history books, 17 of them were prophetic books, and five of them are called wisdom literature. The history basically does what history does. It tells us the story. The prophetic books are really the teaching, preaching, the theology books. They understand our, or unpack our understanding around who God is and what He is saying to us. The wisdom books, these five books, really make sense out of life. They make it real. Uh, they deal with the raw emotions that we all journey with through life. Ecclesiastes is the most philosophical of the five wisdom books. It is indeed a book for thinkers. It asks questions of life that many are not willing to ask. Why do I believe what I believe? What is the story behind the story? What makes the world go round and how do I make sense out of life? Does God even exist? And if He doesn't exist, then what other alternatives are out there and do any of them satisfy? Where did we come from? Where are we headed? Is there any meaning in this short existence that we call life? Now to phrase it the way the book phrases it, in chapter 1, verse 3, it is simply this. What does man gain from all of his labor at which he toils under the sun? That's the key question the author writes. What gain, what profit, what joy, what purpose? In this life that we live, toiling under the sun, what do we profit? Ecclesiastes is really the reflections of a wise man who set out to explore all of these questions to run down every avenue of life's experience, and he spares no expense, he spares no experience, he tests it all, tastes it all, tries it all, and then he writes his report on life. Now, I want to run to the end, so spoiler alert, let me tell you where he lands. The conclusion, the Cole's notes, or the big idea, if you will, that he ends up with is that only with God in the picture, only with a vertical perspective on life does the horizontal make any sense. That if we remove the transcendent, if we remove the spiritual, if we seek to explain life without God, we ultimately find ourselves frustrated and dissatisfied. So only with God does human life make sense. Apart from God, there's no true meaning. Now, the danger in telling you the conclusion of the book is that you might be tempted to stop listening, reading, engaging in the conversation. You might think, okay, the author has already made up his mind before he's even begun the journey. That his conclusions are self-fulfilling prophecies. He believes there's a God, he's a theist, and so, of course, that's the conclusion that he draws. But if you're willing, if you're patient, you will get a glimpse through this book of the philosophical journey of a very deep thinker. A man who has taken a long and courageous journey through life in pursuit of meaning from all the dominant philosophies that shape our worldviews. His autobiography begins with these 
simple words, chapter 1, verse 13, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. This is what the book is about. I've looked into it all. And as we read through the book, we will see that he looks at education, science, engineering, philosophy, psychology. He tests out alcohol, sex, massive amounts of money. He climbs the ladder of achievement, accomplishment, reputation, fame, fortune, and power. He pours himself into hard work, into manual labor, into the arts, into the pursuit of beauty. He puts all of these things under a microscope, and the conclusion that he draws is it is all meaningless. Ecclesiastes 1.14, what a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So, this weekend, as we start, I want to invite you into a journey. An invitation to ask yourself some deeper questions about your life and what you're living for. Are you willing to do the hard work of living an examined life? I would encourage you that you would take time over the next seven weeks to read this book of scripture every week. It's just eight or ten pages long. You can easily read it each of these seven weeks and let it just marinate in your soul, in your spirit, in your mind. You might even want to pick up one of these Don't Be Stupid books and read it alongside of our study. But as we jump into the first few verses today, we're simply going to meet the main character and get the main themes. And so you've got your Bibles open, I hope, Ecclesiastes. The first three verses read this way. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Uh, great encouragement, right? Verse 3, what does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? So in verse 1, we simply meet our guide. We meet our teacher, or some of your translations will say preacher. Uh, the Hebrew name literally means uh, collector, a gatherer, uh, an assembler-er, if you will. And it could be used in two senses of the word, that the teacher or the preacher was a gatherer of people. He gathered around him students, people, a congregation to listen to his teaching. And so it's not uncommon that we would say a preacher needs an audience. But secondly, you can think of it in this way, that as a teacher, as a preacher, he is a collector, a gatherer, a bringer together of wisdom. His trade and his craft was the world of thoughts and ideas, and words. We are told he is David's son and that he was king in Jerusalem. Now, many people assume that this was Solomon, and that makes really good sense. However, it's never specifically stated in the book that it is Solomon, so we make that assumption by the content of the book. Verse 2, we get to the main theme. Meaningless, 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 meaningless. Everything is meaningless. The word is vanity in some of your translations, or meaningless, 38 times it is used throughout this book. And it comes up in other Old Testament books too, but none so repetitive as here in Ecclesiastes. The word is translated uh, in several different ways. Nothingness, perishable, vanity, meaningless, breath, breeze, vapor. Uh, the New Testament book, James, picks up on a similar theme when it asks the question, what's your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn. Very similar thought. And it simply refers to the intangible, transient essence of human life that's impossible for us to grasp in our hands. Uh, Psalm 39 carries the same word. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. There's that phrase. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath. There is that same word. Even those who seem secure. For every one of you who have stood by the graveside of a loved one, you know how true those words really are. 
whether it is a young person or a person who has lived 90 years, somehow those years fly by in a moment. In chapter 1, verse 3, we get two more important themes. And the first is this. It is the idea of toiling and striving and endless pursuing, laboring. The word is trouble that I see under the sun. What does a man gain from all his labor, his laborious toiling? That's a theme that's going to come up again and again in this book. The second is the specific context of all this toiling, specifically under the sun. That is a reference, a quote, a phrase that you need to take note of. It appears 30 times in this book. Under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. In other words, life on this earth, life on the terra firma without any external worldview, life without God, life without a deeper meaning or purpose or design. We would call it naturalism or humanism or materialism, life in the natural sphere. The study I set myself upon, the author says, was to explore all of life from a purely naturalistic perspective. No transcendent reality, nothing eternal, nothing spiritual, just material, no heaven below, above, no hell below. Uh, John Lennon took a page from the teacher when he wrote his song, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. You see, what Lennon was saying is that what the teacher himself is looking for and trying to explore, life under the sun, if we could just get rid of God, religion, heaven, and hell, just let the world be one huge happy family without all our theological and philosophical ponderings on life. It really isn't that hard. Let's just put it to the test and see what we discover. Imagine. Imagine. The first three verses then are the overview for where the whole book is headed. And then in verse 4, the teacher starts his melancholy musings. Generations come and generations go but the earth remains forever. Uh, it means exactly what it sounds like it means. Some are born and others die. Nothing changes. The earth just keeps rolling along. Turn, 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 turn. We know this to be true. Today, literally this day, as we set through this message, 385,000 new babies will be born around the world. On average, 140 million each year. Our world population is rapidly approaching 7.9 million billion people. On the other end of the spectrum, 150,000 people will die today all around the world. People are born, people die, and the earth just keeps spinning. Verses 5, 6, and 7, he gives three illustrations, the endless cycles of life. In verse 8, he asks the question, so when you add this all up, what are you left with? All things are wearisome. All of this, all of these cycles just wear me out. More than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. The word means striving, weary, troubled. Um, might say I'm plumb tuckered out. I'm just weary. Weary of the routines of daily life, we're always left hungry and searching for more, the next experience. It's the echo that we hear of Bono and U2, the famous ballad that rolls through our minds. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't found it. Verse 9 and 10 simply remind us that was, what has been is going to happen again. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. In other words, again and again and again, the cycles of life run their course and there is nothing true, truly new under the sun. Now, of course, technologies change, but life at its very essence is basically the same. We're no different than our parents, or our grands, or our greats. What goes around comes around. 
In verse 11, the narrator asks the question, so why don't we act like we know this? There's no remembrance of men of old. Even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. He says, in essence, we have amnesia. We don't have rear view mirrors. We don't study history. We act like we're the first generation to discover life. We can't remember our own great grandparents' names, let alone the part that they played in shaping the world. And what's more is that when we're gone, we too will be shortly forgotten. The big names of today will be unknown to the kids who are going to be born to today's kids. Now go back and look at chapter 1, verse 2 all over again. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Now you might ask the question, it sounds pretty negative, what evidence does he give for this audacious and actually a devastating claim over our existence? Well, that is the topic for the weeks to come. And this study, if you are truly open to engaging in the dialogue, will force us out of the comfort zone of an unexamined life. It challenges us to think differently, to see differently, to live differently. It's an incredibly important book of Scripture for the days and the times that we're living in, because this book of Scripture dares to do what modern philosophy refuses to do. This book dares to draw a conclusion. It dares to give advice. It dares to call stupid what is stupid. It dares to call wise what is truly wise. It dares to take a stand. It dares to say there is indeed an ultimate standard of right and wrong in the universe, something that modern worldviews refuse to say. In the foreword to Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, uh, Norman Dodge is uh, defending and talking about the title of a book called Rules for Life in the Generation that We Live In. And would anyone buy a book with the word rules in it in today's day and age? But he highlights the hunger in a younger generation for voices that are actually willing to take a stand. And how young adults, millennials in particular, are, are looking for advice on living a full life and, and how they have clamored to Peterson's lectures by the tens of thousands to hear his common sense. It's interesting for sure that a book titled 12 Rules for Life sat on the bestseller list for months and months and months. The moral relativism of our day is creating a generation that's adrift. A generation that is hungry for someone to stand up and say with authority and with conviction, this is the path to life and you should walk in it. And Ecclesiastes is such a book. We should include Ecclesiastes in our don't be stupid list. The teacher is going to challenge all of the isms that make up our worldviews. Naturalism. Naturalism that says there's nothing more to life than what we see in the natural realm. And the bumper sticker for the naturalist could be, you only live once, YOLO, or carpe diem, seize the day you only have today. The teacher challenges the three friends of hedonism and materialism and consumerism. Philosophies that tell us that the highest good in life is the amount of pleasure that we can drain out of life. The highest good is to reduce pain and increase pleasure. And therefore, my greatest aim is to be rich in material things. And the bumper sticker for these philosophies, of course, are he who dies with the most toys wins, or if it feels good, do it. The teacher will also tackle the triplets of relativism, pragmatism, fatalism. All of these views are equally true in stating that there is no absolute standard of right and wrong. All views are equally true, they say. You do your thing, I'll do mine, and just don't force your opinion on me. And the bumper sticker for these worldviews is this, life is hard, then you die. Ecclesiastes forces the question, 
it forces the question, how shall we live our lives? And again, I've given you a truckload to ponder as we open the book. But the teacher has studied it all. Everything that life has to offer us under the sun, I've put it under the microscope, and here's what I've found. And in this book, he seeks to make sense out of the short window of time that we call our lives here on earth, or what Linda Ellis has called our dash. Ecclesiastes acknowledges the innate sense within every one of us for a better life, a better story, a desire for human flourishing. There's, there's a haunting phrase in chapter 3. It says he's placed eternity in our hearts. He's placed an acknowledgement of the eternal. And it is not alone in its critique of life, nor in the solution that it proposes. In fact, all of Scripture echoes this theme, that human flourishing, that life at its very best, must be lived for something above and beyond this present reality. Can we find meaning and purpose and joy, satisfaction in life, if we remove God from the equation? Does life make sense without God? You see, this study is going to challenge that we would think and see and live differently. But how do we do that? And I thought that maybe the best way to wrap up this first message is to simply read some other scriptures over your life because these first 11 verses are fairly discouraging. Listen to what the Creator has to say to you. And first is this, that you were created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, God created mankind, humankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So every man and woman and boy and girl on the planet carries the divine DNA, a stamp of God's image and his likeness. Psalm 139 is one of the most beautiful psalms, and we're not going to put it on the screen. I want you to just listen to these verses. They are so powerful. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me, and such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now listen to these last couple of verses. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But life is short. We know this. The years pass by like a night watchman shift. In Psalm 90, it says our days may come to be 70 or 80 years if our strength endures. And yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Ephesians 5, be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but wise. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. In Colossians 3, the last one, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You see, Ecclesiastes will invite us to think differently. 
but we will not be satisfied to simply stay on the treadmill of life, running ever faster, but not getting ahead. That we will examine the worldviews that are shaping our culture. Ecclesiastes will challenge us to see differently, to get treatment for our nearsightedness and to put on the telescopic lens, to not blindly accept what we see in front of us as the only view of the universe, to have the audacity to challenge the status quo and to stand apart from our culture, to see life differently. And Ecclesiastes calls us to live differently. It calls us to reject the madness of the crowds that carry us along like lemmings, to reject the pursuits and addictions that will ultimately destroy us. And on the other hand, it allows us then to more fully live life than ever before. Because the joys and the pleasures and the beauty of this life are just a foretaste of the glory that is yet to come. If this in this good life, in this fallen world, if it's this good, how much greater is it going to be in a renewed heavens and earth? And our daily life then rolls up into worship of our Creator who gives us every good gift. The sorrows and suffering of this life are temporary, so we can endure them. Knowing that there's more to this story that is yet to be written, we understand that creation is groaning, that we ourselves are groaning, that life under the sun is sometimes a painful journey, but these sufferings fade in light of the glory set before us. And while the book never explicitly speaks of Jesus Christ, the shadows of the cross are all over this book. Because the book tells us in the simplest of terms, our world is broken. And it needs a fix beyond the here and now. The teacher gives us the bad news right up front. If you're looking to fix your own life, let me tell you from experience, it cannot be done. Who will rescue us from this broken world? So we look forward to the cross of Jesus, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the reigning and ruling life of Christ. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We find our hope and our strength not in this life, but we find our hope and our strength in Jesus and Jesus alone. I'm so excited about the next few weeks. They are intensely personal and practical passages of Scripture. I would encourage you, as I already have, read this book each week. Each week, if you can go through it and think and ponder the thoughts, the questions that this teacher asks, if we're open to it, I think our lives are going to be changed. We will think differently. We will see differently. And Lord willing, we will live differently. Let me pray with you. Father, I pray that as we enter into this study, some have called it one of the most challenging books of Scripture because it is so audaciously realistic. The author who pulls no punches in looking at life under the sun and how difficult and challenging the questions of life can be. But Father, if it does nothing else, it points us to a solution that is beyond us. It points us to the solution that we have in you and in your plan for our lives. And so, Lord, specifically during this time of COVID-19, when we have been separated from one another and many, many people seem to be so discouraged in these days, I pray that you would take this book of Scripture and that you would bring it to life, that you would make the Scriptures live in our lives. I pray for encouragement for those who are alone and who are struggling under the weight of these various philosophies of life that seem to be crushing them down. And instead, Lord, that you would speak the words of life and hope and strength that are ours in you and in you alone. And so, Lord, we pray that you would teach us by your Spirit, that you would teach us for your glory and for our great joy. In Jesus' name, amen.